The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. Where there are divisions, bring your peace. Where our lives have become too settled, trouble our waters by the Holy Spirit and move us to make straight the highway for our God. Where we have found ourselves overcome by fears, frustrations, griefs, and hurt, bring your comfort. Rend the heavens, O Lord, and come down, and by your coming, strengthen your church to serve you with purity of heart. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness the way prepares the way of the Lord, makes straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out. And I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get to you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord comes with a might, and his arms rule for him, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd, he will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A reading from Second Peter. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. That the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are about to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire? But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, Strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So also our beloved Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey, and he proclaimed, 
The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pay attention to the verb tenses in your thinking. That's the advice that a mental health counselor shared with me and some other pastors this week as we talked about our own struggles and the struggles we see in our communities, specifically the pastoral care needs of so many hurting in different ways this holiday season. Pay attention to the verb tenses in your thinking and listen closely to the tenses others use when talking with you. Beneath the presenting fear, anger, frustration, disappointment, ask yourself, am I, are they, are we functioning primarily in the past, the present, or the future. And if we only talk or think about the past or only project into the future, what maybe are we hiding from, avoiding in the present? Pay attention to the verb tenses in your thinking. Good advice anytime, but helpful especially as I sat down to look over our lessons for this week. Take our Old Testament lesson, Isaiah 40. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, 
says your God. Present tense. God calling Isaiah to speak words of comfort right now to his suffering community. And then speak tenderly to Jerusalem. God commands Isaiah. Or we might say on this second Sunday of Advent, speak peace into their lives. Tell them that they have served their term, that they've done their time, that their penance is over, for Israel has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins, we read. We have to be awfully careful here. This conception of God that he actively punishes us in this life, that if we make a mistake, he's right there, ready to smite us. This is a very ancient way of thinking about God, and as a pastor, I hear it a lot. What did I do to deserve this, pastor? Is COVID-19 the result of America turning her back on God? If I had been a better Christian, had more faith, not been so selfish, maybe God would have spared me this loss? We hear in this sort of language transactional thinking. If I am good, then God will be good. And God will be good to me. And this is a very deep and natural spiritual instinct. But it's not good Lutheran theology. There are natural consequences for our sin for sure. But I think what Isaiah is giving voice to here is something many of us have experienced from time to time. These sentiments that we hear in this passage from Isaiah, don't they express our feelings? Feelings that we need to get below today, though, so that we can reach the bedrock of some truths. Does God allow us to suffer the consequences of our sinful actions in this life? Certainly. Does God seemingly allow bad things to happen in this world, things that are hard to understand, that don't make sense in the moment, things that are maybe hard to square with his goodness, for sure. But God is good, and God can do no other than good, and God's goodness is of such a magnitude that God can even draw good out of evil and suffering and sinful errors in this world. By his mercy, daily bending toward the good, that which the evil one intends for evil, for destruction. Or as we used to say in youth group, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. We may not always experience that, but we must affirm that. That is our faith-filled conviction. And if God is good, that means that God loves you as much on your best day as on your worst. He doesn't love the you you might become, but he loves the you you are right now in the present. And he desires for you to know peace. Peace with God Peace with your neighbor, peace within yourself. But back to Isaiah 40. Listen for the verb tenses. Israel has served her term, has paid her penalty. She has received correction. Isaiah's prophetic word of peace to his community is rooted in a confidence that God has already acted in the past. God has laid the groundwork, prepared his people to return home, to leave their Babylonian captivity and to come back and rebuild the broken walls of Jerusalem. God has taken Israel's sin, all the ways that Judah has failed as a nation and says to them now through the prophet Isaiah, you are ready. And with that, Isaiah pivots from the past tense to the present with a prophetic word that will echo down through history, down to the time of John the Baptist, a voice cries out, present tense, in the wilderness, 
Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low and the uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Hear that command, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This is what Advent is all about. Christ coming, future tense, as something we prepare for and experience now. Present tense. And maybe we hear this language of transforming the landscape and we imagine excavation equipment, digging and moving earth or blasting caps to level cliffs and carve out pathways. Spiritually speaking, I do think there are moments where the Holy Spirit undertakes major renovations of our hearts. But I want to suggest to you that more often God's work can be awfully quiet, subtle, hidden, slow even, at least from our perspective. So the people of Israel are formed by the harsh desert where they wander for 40 years and the Judeans are awaiting their deliverance in Babylon for 70 and it will be another 700 years after they return to Jerusalem before this prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled in Christ's coming. These very words in Isaiah will issue forth from the mouth of the prophet John when he points to his cousin, our Lord, and testifies to his power and declares that he is the one who is coming, we have awaited. He uses that word coming, which is what Advent means. And if it's true that Christ is coming, not just in some distant future, but even now, Emmanuel, God with us in the present, then, sisters and brothers in Christ, that is indeed a great comfort to us. But what Advent does that is psychologically useful is that it names the times of waiting, the times of impatience, the times of struggle. In the darkest season of our hemisphere, we recognize that it's not always so easy to see the light, which is why our reading from 2 Peter is so rich. In our epistle for the second Sunday of Advent, St. Peter writes, Do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Did you hear that? We feel that God is slow at times, slow to save, slow to show up and set things right, slow to show us the course, the next step to take, the right choice to make. But what Peter reminds us is God is always at work. And what we perceive as slowness is actually God's mercy, God's grace, God's gift of time. Time to prepare, time to make ready, time to receive in the fullness of time. Our God, our King. So go back to Isaiah's language of leveling mountains, of lifting up valleys, and think about the Grand Canyon as we did in our midweek Advent service. How over 70, 80 million years, the Colorado River carved out that nearly 300 mile long scar in Arizona's landscape. If we were watching that process over a lifetime, how much change would we really witness? Yet little by little, water, wind, glaciers, erode rock formations and carve that canyon out of the earth. Isaiah imagines a landscape transformed so as to accommodate God's presence so that the nations might stream to God's holy temple 
atop Mount Zion. But as Peter points out, to God a thousand years is like one day. So God's saving work can seem to us very slow at times, even imperceptible. Yet insofar as we submit to God's saving work, what Catholic Bishop Robert Barron calls God's saving pressure, insofar as we present our hearts to the Lord and participate in God's work of preparation, then the valleys of sorrow in us can be lifted up and the mountains and hills of pride made low and the uneven ground in us leveled and the rough places in our hearts planed smooth. It's all there in Second Peter. God calls us to repentance. Why? Because our sin threatens him, diminishes his power, robs him of his glory? No. Because without repentance... Without forgiveness, Peter says, we cannot know peace. And it's there in our Mark reading too. The people streaming to the Jordan to receive the baptism for the forgiveness of sins and there to publicly confess the ways that they have failed to love God and others. This is the chief way that we prepare the way of the Lord. A returning to our baptisms in repentance. For it is we who are made to be temples of the Holy Spirit. And it is the landscape of our lives that Isaiah and John and Peter are calling us to attend to. Not because you and I can create peace any more than we can build the perfect society or flawless institutions or churches without any problems. No. True peace begins in the heart, and it is the work of the Holy Spirit. The question is, how am I, how are you, how are we preparing the way and accommodating ourselves and our lives to God's peace? Like I said, it begins by returning to our Lord in repentance daily bearing our hearts before the Lord in prayer and submitting our rough places to his saving pressure. Unless we do this, unless we begin by recognizing our need for a Savior, well then Advent remains merely a monthly countdown and Christmas just another date on the calendar. So pay attention. Stay alert. Notice the verb tenses in your thinking and your speaking this Advent. And do not forget that in every moment, our timeless Christ is eternally present. Closer to you than your next breath, and with each breath drawing you closer to your salvation. So look. Listen, stay alert, Bethlehem, for there is one who comes to you this day offering mercy and comfort and peace. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come. Amen.
let us confess again our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. to join me in praying that prayer that our Lord taught his first followers. Lord, remember us in your coming kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Feel like we're at a baseball game. <laughs> Excuse you.